Hello. So, in this video, we're going to be doing the absolute values, and in particular, we're going to be doing the analytic view. Um, so, in this case, what we're really going to be doing is talking about how to translate from sort of the absolute value notation to a useful, if more annoying, notation. So, as we mentioned in the last one, uh, the last video about the geometric understanding, and as you've probably heard before, the absolute value, one of the sort of interpretations, is that it uh, makes values positive. And the question is, how do you represent this? How do you do this analytically? How do you do this with algebra, right? So uh, I'll, I'm going to go through sort of a concrete test case in order to develop the uh, general way that we go about this. So what if we had, for example, uh, the function f of x is, let's say, absolute value of 2x minus 1 plus 7. <coughs> now, as this sort of is written, it appears that it is a function, which it is, but it sort of appears like you would just sort of put in a number, compute it, and get one out, and it would be very systematic. And in some sense, that's true, but in some sense, that's a little misleading. Because, uh, for example, looking at this, if I were to put in, let's say, f of 2. So to compute f of 2, right, I would plug in 2 for x, so I'd have absolute value 2 times 2 minus 1 plus 7 which is absolute value of 4 minus 1 plus 7, which is absolute value of 3 plus 7. Now here I can look at that and say absolute value of 3, I know what that is, that's just 3, right? It's already positive. So since it's already positive, I do nothing. And in fact, that's going to be a phrase that's going to come back, so I'm going to write it off to the side here. Do nothing, by which I mean I can just get rid of these absolute values because they're doing nothing. So this is then 3 plus 7, right? Because I can just get rid of these, which means that I really have 10. <coughs> now in contrast, if I were to look at, let's say, f of negative 2, again, do the same steps. So this is 2 times negative 2 minus 1 plus 7. I'm going to do this a little faster. So this is 2 times negative 2 is negative 4, minus 1 is negative 5. So I have absolute value negative 5 plus 7. But here, my absolute values aren't doing nothing. I mean, they're doing something, right? And in particular, it needs to make this negative 5 positive. So here, I need to, uh, in order to, to write the other, another way of thinking about this is that I need to flip the sign, right? It's negative 5 now, so I'm going to flip the sign, which gives me 5 plus 7, which gives me 12. Now this wasn't um, like crazy difficult or anything, this 12 did not come out nicely and I don't want people thinking I wrote like 8 or something there, so 12, there we go. So this was hopefully by no means like challenging, right? But the thing I want to sort of point out here is that whether or not the absolute values did something depended on what was inside it by the time we got there, right? And in some sense, uh, having x be sort of a positive number ended up giving us a positive, but it wasn't, it wasn't x that we took an absolute value of here. It was some computation at the end of the day. Same thing here is eventually we did a computation and got down to some value where we realized we need to flip the sign in order to keep going, okay? So if I look at this, this original piece here, all right, I'm going back to that same, same equation. In order to represent the fact that I need to make that positive, I need to make it positive under certain circumstances. So what I really need to figure out is when do I need to make it positive, right? When is it that I get some positive value and nothing happens, right? The absolute values do nothing. And when is it that I need to flip the sign? So my first sort of first step Step one is determine 
when. I need, or maybe I shouldn't write this in first person. Determine when the absolute value does something. <clears throat> so to do that, I need to know Right, so I'm, I'm trying to figure out when the absolute value does something. To do that, I need to know when is the inside sort of not negative, right? Because if it's not negative, then I can just take the value. If it's three, I'm good. If it's zero, I'm good. If it's 27, that's good. The absolute values don't do anything. Versus when is it negative, okay? So to do that then, and this is a key idea that is often skipped, so I'm gonna really draw attention to this. I need to take all of the stuff that is inside the absolute value. So I'm gonna take all of 2x minus one and figure out for what x values this thing is greater than or equal to zero, meaning I'm going to set this greater than or equal to zero, right? And then solve for x. So here I move the one over, so I get 2x greater than or equal to one, which gives me x greater than or equal to one half. This then tells me that if x is greater than or equal to one half, that tells me that two x minus one is greater than or equal to zero, which means whatever I computed in here is greater than zero, which tells me the absolute value does nothing. So here, uh, for these x values, the absolute value does nothing. And for all the other x values, right? And so remember, this is x greater than or equal to 1 half. So all the other x values then are x less than 1 half, strictly less than. So I'll write a little note there. The, re the other x values, the rest um, of the domain. So I'll just write the rest. In math, we would call this the complement of, uh, of that set. So this is when the absolute value flips the sign. Okay. But again, I want to I want to sort of point out here that what's really happening is I'm I'm figuring out that for what concrete numbers that when I plug it in I'm going to get a positive number inside, and thus the absolute value isn't going to do anything, versus for concrete numbers that when I plug in, right, negative two is less than one half, that if I were to plug it in, I'd get eventually a negative number, and I'd have to flip the sign, okay? This is important because I'm going to eventually get to a step that's going to look really intuitive, uh, really unintuitive. It'll look like I'm saying the absolute value is negative, and that's not what's happening um, because of this. So I'm going to explain that again when we get there. Okay, so then step two. So step two, I have to figure out uh, how does one flip the sign? Okay, because I know that the absolute value is gonna be just whatever's in there for certain values, and I know for the other values, it's going to have to eventually flip it, okay? So the way we do this is the same every time. So the way we're doing this is we actually need to, so how do we flip the sign? By, so we wanna make a negative into a positive. So how do we do that? Well, how would you normally do that? You know, take a second, think about it. How would you say, what would you sort of do as a mathematical operation to a negative that makes it positive, right? For example, you could add a number, but you'd have to know what the negative number was to add a big enough number in order to make it sort of positive. And even worse than that, what you added would have to be sort of the right, the correct value in order to um, make sure that it's exactly the right number after you've added something. 
So adding a number would be really hard to figure out sort of a general form of what do you add. Subtracting numbers, subtracting a positive number isn't really going to work for us so well, right? Because that's just going to make it more negative. But we have other operations. For example, you can multiply by something that will make it an, a positive without changing the value, right? So really what we want to do is multiply by negative 1. That's how we flip the sign, OK? So this is really sort of, this step is really the conceptual, uh, a conceptual step. This isn't really a step you're going to do each time because we know now how to do it. Um, so maybe I'll actually write this as like, let me put this as 1.2 because we want to know how this is going to work. The actual step two then is to rewrite the actual function, the function, by splitting into cases. What I mean by that is this whole time I've been saying, OK, if the absolute value is positive, we do nothing. If the absolute value is negative, we do a thing, right? We multiply by negative 1 to flip the sign. Those are both, those are two cases. It's either this or it's that, right? And so we want to rewrite the function in a way that sort of represents that fact, that really even though we have what appears to be a nice function that is normally relatively OK to use, Algebraically, it's very hard to use because it's hiding the fact that there are two possibilities for this function. And I, I don't know which one it is by just looking at that. So the way we deal with that is we write it using these two cases. In particular, we do that by using right, the function splitting into cases. This is exactly one of the reasons we have um, piecewise functions. That doesn't look right, but whatever. Piecewise functions. Okay, so if you remember our piecewise function then, f of x equals. So we're going to have two cases. Either the inside is positive or it's negative, right? Now, piecewise functions have what the function is and the domain over which that is the case, right? So if I'm going to do, so let me try to make this color coordinated here. So I'm going to write out the domain piece first. And that's, that was the purpose of step one, to find the domain aspects. So here, I'm going to have one function type if x is less than 1 half. And I'm going to have another function type for when x is greater than or equal to 1 half. Okay. In both cases, it's going to look like the original function with a twist. So I'm going to write in sort of pieces and then edit them. So wait till I'm sort of all done talking before you really sync this in. So I'm going to have 2x minus 1 plus 7. And then I'm also, again, going to have 2x minus 1 plus 7. Now, <coughs> in the case where x is greater than 1 half, I have had absolute value bars right here, but as we've discussed, they do nothing, meaning that I can actually get rid of these. Now, it's a little dangerous to just not write them because sometimes there's like a number in front, like three times absolute value stuff. So really when we say do nothing, what we mean is get rid of the absolute value, replace them with parentheses. Okay. And I'm going to do the same thing here, but that's not all in that case. So here, I can do that, and I'm done, because there's nothing else, right? It does nothing else. It's just I get rid of them, put in parentheses, life is good. But over here, right, I need to flip the sign. So I still put in parentheses, because I always want to do that when I get rid of the absolute value. But I'm also, right, I need to represent that this sign gets flipped, because what's happening is, is if x is less than 1 half, this is a negative number in disguise. Right, Because if I have, say, x equals 0, I have negative 1 here. And so when the absolute value comes along, it needs to make that negative into a positive, And it does that by multiplying 
by negative one. I'm gonna actually write negative one just to make it clear, but you could just put the negative sign, that, that's fine. I'm just trying to be very clear what's happening. So although it looks like I'm making this into a negative, again, I wanna be very clear, that's not what's happening, right? Because this is still gonna be a positive value because of the domain restriction. Domain is restricting to the point where this 2x minus one piece is negative, so when I multiply it by negative one, I get a positive as a result. That's why I'm, I'm correctly uh, representing the absolute value over here, okay? And finally, if I want, and really I should, um, I can simplify this by cleaning up the algebra here, right? So I can have f of x equals The case where I have less than one half, I can have, I'm gonna have a negative, I can distribute that negative, so I'm gonna have minus two x minus minus one, so that's plus one plus seven, so that's plus eight, when x is less than one half. And here, I have nothing going on on the outside, so I just have two x minus one plus seven, so that is two x plus six for x greater than one half, greater than or equal, excuse me, one half, okay? All right, so this is how you uh, translate from going from an absolute value to the piecewise definition of absolute value. So to go from here to here, you need to first sort of figure out what the domain restriction is. And sometimes that can be more tricky, um, and we'll do other examples of that later. Then you wanna use this idea, so this isn't really a step, but you wanna use this idea that multiplying by negative one is how you flip the sign. So in the domain restriction, where you need to flip the sign, you take whatever was in the absolute value, in parentheses, times minus one. Even though that may, you like you look at that and your brain might think, oh, that's making it negative, but it's not because the domain restriction already made it negative, so this times negative one makes it positive. Otherwise, you don't have to worry about it, right? It's just the parentheses and you're good. And then simplify, combine stuff, make it look pretty, but otherwise that's, that's how we go, okay? And I know I'm sort of beating a dead horse here, but I really wanna emphasize that what we, we don't care about the x being positive or negative. Notice I'm not talking about x is negative, x is positive here. What we care about is whether the inside is positive or negative. This is one of those things where a lot of the times people sort of jump from here to here and then they think, okay, well, I multiply them by negative one when it's negative and they think x is negative. Leave it alone when it's positive, they think that means x is positive, so they have zeros here when that's not right. Okay, so we need to know where these sort of transition points are by doing this step. Okay, it's very rarely the case that it actually coincides with x being greater than or, or less than zero. Okay, so this is the analytic view for absolute value, how you go from absolute value to piecewise. Um, I'll also make a comment here that, uh, so we're obviously gonna require doing this in pre-calc, but you actually do need to do this a lot in calculus because you can't sort of take derivatives and limits nicely with just absolute values. Uh, they cause all, they wreak all kinds of havoc when you try to leave it as an absolute value. So most of the time you really do have to actually do this and then try to use this stuff for derivatives, limits, and things like that, okay? Is that, is that?